Hello and welcome back to Zoology 141. Today we're going to start the last chapter of the semester and that's going to be on the special senses. In today's lecture we're going to cover olfaction and gustation, that is smell and taste. And we're also going to cover hearing. There will be a separate lecture dealing with vision. Okay, the senses that we're covering in this chapter are the special senses and we call them the special senses because they're all located in the head, that is they are all cephalized. And so the special senses include our sense of smell, which is olfaction, our sense of taste, which is gustation, our sense of hearing, and also equilibrium and vision. And so one of the questions that might pop up on the exam is which types of sensory receptors are used to detect each of the above stimuli? For example, what type of receptors do we use to detect smell? Well, the answer for smell is chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors, remember, detect chemicals that are either in the air or dissolved in saliva. And so both olfaction and gustation make use of chemoreceptors. On the other hand, hearing is a sensation where we're sensing vibrations in the ear that are moving from the external ear to the middle ear to the inner ear. And so here we have mechanoreceptors called hair cells that are responsible for transducing that stimuli. We also have mechanoreceptors in our vestibular apparatus which is used to detect equilibrium. Now there's two different types of equilibrium and we'll talk about those later on, but both of those make use of mechanoreceptors similar to the hair cells that we saw in hearing. And finally, vision is a sense that processes light stimuli that are coming in. So the receptors here are going to be photoreceptors. And of course, the photoreceptors are located within the retina of the eye. And so the first special sense that we're going to cover today is olfaction. And olfaction, of course, is our sense of smell. And so smell actually involves the transduction of odorant molecules into a graded potential. So odorant molecules are just molecules that are aromatic, that are volatile, and they bind to the mucus uh, within our olfactory system. And within the olfactory epithelium, these odorant molecules will bind to olfactory hairs on receptor cells. And within these olfactory hairs is where the process of transduction happens, that is forming that graded potential. Now, as humans, our sense of smell is not so good. It's not as good as cats or dogs, and it's not as good as most mammals, in fact. But despite that, it still is quite acute. We can distinguish somewhere around 10,000 different odors, so that's pretty impressive. And it's also very sensitive to certain types of compounds. We can detect some odors at extremely low concentrations. For example, we can detect minute concentrations of methylmercaptan in the air. Now, methylmercaptan is a compound that's produced by rotting vegetation, for example, rotting or fermented cabbage. And we don't come across it that frequently, but it is a smell that we can detect at very low concentrations. And that's why the gas company actually puts methylmercaptan within propane and natural gas, because it allows us to detect a gas leak uh, at very low concentrations. Uh, typically, we can start to smell that gas uh, at a concentration below which it's likely to explode. So now we're going to take a look at the cells that make up the olfactory membrane. The first cells we have are the olfactory receptor cells. Now these are basically bipolar neurons with cilia or olfactory hairs. And so it's important to realize here that these are basically modified sensory neurons that have little bitty cilia-like endings that are going to bind to the odorant molecules. Now we also have supporting cells within that epithelium, and they tend to be columnar epithelium. And we also have basal cells. Basal cells are basically stem cells that help us to replace our receptor cells on a regular basis. And that's because the receptor cells uh, are destroyed and die off uh, is a normal consequence of smelling. For example, think about the last time you accidentally inhaled um, some very volatile solvent or something like that. Uh, it probably resulted in a very bad odor, and it also probably killed off some sensory neurons uh, within your olfactory epithelium. So if that happens, we can regenerate these cells over time by growth and division of our basal cells. The other thing that we have within the olfactory epithelium are olfactory glands. And these are glands that are going to produce mucus. Now mucus is important for smell because it helps to dissolve the odorant molecules into a semi-liquid. And it's necessary to have those dissolved in order for them to bind to the olfactory hairs. Now, if you have a cold or something like that and you have a lot of mucus, uh, chances are you're going to want to take a decongestant and something that's going to dry that mucus out. 
but when you do, you might notice that your sense of smell is a little bit less than normal. You might also notice that your sense of taste is also somewhat diminished, and that's because smell does play a very important role in our perception of taste, which we'll talk about in a few slides. Now it's important to realize that the epithelium and the glands within it are all innervated by cranial nerve number seven. So think about what nerve that is. On old Olympus towering tops A, finally, that's the facial nerve. So nerve number seven helps to innervate the olfactory glands and other cells within the olfactory epithelium. Now here's just a little overview on the process of olfaction. As we said before, the human nose, even though it's not as good as other animals, can still detect hundreds if not thousands of different scents, and it can detect combinations of scents as well. So in olfactory reception, what we do is form a generator potential in that receptor cell, and that's because the receptor cell is basically a modified sensory neuron. So in this case, it's going to be transducing the stimulus into a graded potential and also generating action potentials in the same cell. So of all the five special senses, olfaction is the only one that utilizes a single sensory neuron to do both jobs, transduction and transmission. Now, odors are something that adapt very quickly. For example, if you walk into a house that belongs to somebody that has lots of cats, initially you might be bowled over by the smell of kitty litter and cat urine and feces and things like that but if you spend 15 or 20 minutes there you'll notice that odor tends to go away or dissipate you're not aware of it quite as much anymore and that's because smell is a sense that adapts fairly quickly now olfactory receptors which again are sensory neurons are going to convey their nerve impulses to the olfactory nerves olfactory bulbs and finally the olfactory tracts and this is going to route this sensory information uh, into the thalamus and up to the appropriate region of the cerebral cortex. Now remember that smell is one of these senses that is also tightly tied into our limbic system. The limbic system was basically the emotional brain. And so sometimes you'll come across a smell, maybe a perfume or a cologne that your boyfriend or girlfriend wore when you were in high school, and that will just snap, bring you back to a time uh, and bring some emotions on because those odors are tied into the emotional brain. Now there's a disorder associated with smell that occurs with age, and that's called hyposmia. And remember, hypo means below, and osmia here means to smell. And so hyposmia is a reduced ability to smell, and this affects about half of those individuals over the age of 65, and around 75% of people over the age of 80. So they have a reduced ability to smell, and as a result, they're not aware of their body odor quite as much, or about how much perfume or cologne they're putting on. If you've ever gone to, let's say, a function where there's a lot of older people in the audience, you'll notice that initially to you the smell of perfume and cologne is almost overwhelming. And that's because these people don't really have a very good sense of smell to begin with. They put the perfume on, they don't smell it, they add a little bit more, and so it takes more uh, perfume uh, on their body until they can smell it and they think they have adequate amounts. But to somebody that's younger, like you, uh, you might think, oh my gosh, that's, that's just atrocious, that's way too much perfume. But again, if you sit in that audience for more than a few minutes, chances are that sense of smell is going to adapt and you're no longer going to be bowled over by the large amount of perfume that the audience is wearing. Another disorder that can occur with olfaction is something called anosmia. Now remember, anosmia here means lack of smell, and so there are certain conditions that can cause us to lose our sense of smell, either temporarily or sometimes even permanently. There are some antibiotics and other drugs which affect our olfactory nerves, and in some cases can lead to permanent loss of our sense of smell. Okay, this slide just shows the six steps necessary in order for us to transduce and transmit information about odorant molecules. And so the first step is that we're going to have our odorant molecules dissolving in the semi-liquid mucus uh, within our olfactory epithelium. And so think about your opening up the oven, it's Thanksgiving, and those turkey molecules are wafting out of the oven. Now as they move into your nose and up to your olfactory epithelium, they're going to bind to that mucus, dissolve in the mucus, and then they're going to come in contact with our olfactory hairs. Now the olfactory hairs here are simply just sort of like free nerve endings or dendrites that are binding to those odorant molecules. Now once that happens, we're going to form something called a generator potential in that same receptor cell. A generator potential is a graded potential that's formed in a cell that does both transduction and transmission. 
So if we have enough transduction going on, that graded potential is going to summate and eventually lead to an action potential. That is, a nerve impulse that is generated within the same cell and propagates along that receptor cell axon. Now these axons will go up through the cribriform plate in the base of the cranium and then there they will synapse with secondary neurons within the olfactory bulb. Now we tend to call the olfactory bulb cranial nerve number one, but that's not really true. Cranial nerve number one is actually a very short, tiny nerve that links the olfactory epithelium to the olfactory bulb. Now assuming that our receptor cells have generated enough neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter will travel across the synaptic cleft, stimulate those secondary neurons, and those secondary neurons within the olfactory bulb will fire off their own action potentials, which will be transmitted uh, towards the, well, eventually the cerebral cortex. But remember, a lot of times we're going to go to a relay station, for example, the thalamus first. Okay, the next sense we're going to tackle here is gustation, and gustation is our sense of taste. And taste here requires the dissolving of substances which are called tastants in the saliva. So just like olfaction, we are detecting chemicals, but these chemicals must be dissolved in a liquid in order for transduction to occur. And so scientists have described five primary stimuli uh, to the gustatory cortex. So we have five tastes, sweet, sour, bitter, salty and umami. Now think about why we have the ability to detect these five different tastes. And I'm going to tell you it has something to do with evolution. Our ability to detect different types of food molecules and our preference for these molecules has arisen because of the process of evolution. For example, think about foods that are sweet. What is in foods that makes them sweet? Sweet foods have lots and lots of monosaccharides and disaccharides. That is, they have sugars. And so our ability to detect sweet things uh, helps us to identify foods that are high in sugar. And remember, sugar is an energy source. Now, on the other hand, sour foods are foods that are somewhat acidic. For example, citrus fruits are acidic, and so our ability to detect sour there tells us that, well, this is acidic, I don't want to eat too much of it, uh, I can get an upset stomach. But the other thing that sour foods tell us is that not only is it acidic, but sometimes these sour foods like citrus are associated with vitamin C. Now let's look at bitter. What kinds of foods are bitter? We don't really have anything shown here, but in Hawaii a lot of people talk about bitter melon, and that's true, and that's definitely an acquired taste. I think about a child. Uh, are they going to eat bitter foods uh, by their own preference? Probably not, because it turns out that bitter foods tend to have alkaloids in them. For example, a lot of unripe fruits are bitter, and a lot of other plant material is bitter as well. And bitterness is important because oftentimes it helps us to detect things that are going to make us sick, at the very least, or may even be poisonous. Okay, now let's look at salty. We definitely have an ability to detect salty foods, and we really have a preference for salty foods. Uh, here in the United States, we probably get too much salt. But remember that our preference for salty foods evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago when we probably didn't have the same access to salt. Now think about why salt might be necessary. Well, salt is an electrolyte. Sodium and chloride are both essential ions needed to maintain proper blood osmolality. They're needed for nerve impulse transmission and all sorts of processes over the body. So that's why we've evolved to have this craving for salty foods. And now let's look at umami. Uh, of all the five tastes, umami is the one that was most recently discovered and named, and as you might guess, it was named by the Japanese. And so umami here sort of means savory. So foods that are savory here, of course, are things like meat, soy sauce, and fermented soybean curd. They're all very, very savory. And what savory tells us about most foods is that this food is high in protein and high in amino acids. And remember, amino acids are essential nutrients that the body needs to synthesize its own proteins. Now, you might be saying, well, I don't see other tastes on here. For example, I don't see spicy. Spicy is not really a taste and that we don't really have taste buds that detect spicy per se. But spicy is a combination of maybe a little bit of umami, if that spiciness is coming from, let's say, fermented cabbage or something like that. But it also has a little bit of a bite to it. 
and that bite here is actually stimulation of noise receptors. So when you're detecting spiciness, you're actually detecting pain. We do have noise receptors uh, within the epithelium of our tongue in our oral cavity. And so when you taste something that's spicy, like habaneros or something like that, that spiciness is actually being detected by the noise receptors or pain receptors in our mouth. So as you probably already know, the receptors for taste are found on the tongue and they're found within something called taste buds. Now taste buds are actually microscopic structures. You cannot see them with the naked eye, but they are located on larger structures that you can see with the naked eye. And these structures are called papillae. And a papilla is simply a bump. And we have several of these bumps along the surface of the tongue. A lot of them are back in the posterior two-thirds of the tongue, but we also have them uh, other places on the sides of the tongue and elsewhere within the oral cavity. So the papillae contain the taste buds. And the majority of papillae in the human mouth are called fungiform papillae because they're sort of mushroom shaped. Now, if you look at other animals, for example, cats, they'll have a second type of papillae called a filiform papilla, and these papillae uh, do not really have taste buds on them, but they are cornified and horn-like, and they tend to point backwards into the mouth. And so think about the last time you got licked by a cat, and what did that feel like? Well, probably didn't feel too pleasant because cats have a sandpaper-like tongue because of these filiform papillae. The papillae themselves are, like I said, are very cornified, and the purpose of these papillae are to help with grooming, that is pulling excess hair off the body, and they're also important for licking the last little bits of meat off a bone. So now let's take a closer look at our fungiform papilla. Now the fungiform papilla themselves are sort of sitting in a recessed area, like a little recessed moat uh, within the tongue. So surrounding this papilla would be a very narrow moat filled with saliva. And on the sides of that papilla would be our taste buds. Now the taste buds uh, get access to the outside saliva by tiny little pores that are in the sides of the papilla. And so the food molecules dissolve in the saliva and that saliva food mixture um, basically enters the taste pores and binds with our taste buds. And again, taste buds is where the transduction of taste occurs and taste buds are a type of chemoreceptor. Okay, let's take a look at the cells that make up the taste bud. Now, first of all, we're going to have supporting cells. Supporting cells just give some structure to the taste bud. They don't have any role in transduction or transmission. The other cells that we have here are our gustatory receptor cells. These are the cells that are shown in blue. And so the gustatory receptor cell's job is to transduce the stimuli of the food molecules and transduce that into a graded potential. So on the surface of these cells, we have gustatory hairs which extend out of that little hole uh, in the side of the papilla. And so the gustatory hairs are going to be the structures that bind to the food molecules that are dissolved in the saliva. And of course, we also have basal cells here. The basal cells have a regenerative function that is just like what we saw with olfaction. The basal cells are responsible for regenerating new gustatory receptor cells because we're destroying gustatory receptor cells all the time. Think about the last time you took a big slug of coffee and then realized, oh my gosh, that's way too hot, and you burnt your tongue. Or you're eating really hot pizza out of the microwave, you bit down, and then bam, you blistered your mouth. So anytime that happens, chances are you're killing off a fair number of these gustatory receptor cells. And for a little while, you might have a reduced sense of taste. But over time, we're able to regenerate those cells because the basal cells can form more gustatory receptor cells. Now the big important point here that I want you to realize is that the gustatory cells only do transduction. That is, they are a separate receptor cell that transduces the stimulus and secretes neurotransmitter, but they do not form action potentials. The action potentials here are actually going to be formed in a second cell, which is an afferent sensory neuron. So now let's take a look at the physiology of gustation or taste. So first of all, we have our tasting molecules, which have dissolved in our saliva, and they're binding to the gustatory hairs on the surface of the receptor cells. Now the receptor cells are then going to transduce that stimulus into a receptor potential. A receptor potential is simply a graded potential that's formed in a specialized receptor cell. Now that receptor cell will then release a certain type of neurotransmitter, which will bridge the gap between the receptor cell and the afferent sensory neuron. Now, if enough of that neurotransmitter binds to the afferent sensory neuron, that sensory neuron will then form action potentials. And so we have two different cells here that are helping to uh, transduce and transmit information about taste. The gustatory receptor cell does transduction, 
and the afferent sensory neuron does transmission. So remember back a couple lectures ago when we talked about the cranial nerves and we said that there are 12 cranial nerves and each of them has a sensory and also a motor function. There was a few that only had sensory functions but the most of these are going to be mixed nerves. And so the nerves that help to transmit our sense of taste are the cranial nerves number 7, number 9, and also number 10. So cranial nerve number 7 was the facial nerve and this helped to innervate the anterior two-thirds of the tongue whereas cranial nerve number nine was the glossopharyngeal nerve, and this serves the posterior one-third of the tongue. On the other hand, the vagus nerve, or cranial nerve number 10, uh, innervates the palate and also the epiglottis. We do have some taste buds located within these structures. And so the sensory information travels from these sensory neurons to the thalamus, to the limbic system, and hypothalamus, and eventually to the gustatory cortex. Now remember the gustatory cortex is located principally on the parietal lobe of the cerebrum. And so the gustatory cortex is where we first become aware of taste and we also have association areas which help us to recognize and identify certain tastes. Okay, now we're going to go on and talk about our sense of hearing and also our sense of equilibrium. And both of these are transduced within the ear. So as far as hearing goes, the ear is actually divided into three regions, the external ear, the middle ear and the internal ear. So the external ear's job is basically to funnel sound waves uh, to the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is basically the eardrum. If you've ever stuck a Q-tip a little too far into your ear and all of a sudden you go, ouch, that's because you've touched the tympanic membrane. Now on the other side of the tympanic membrane we have the middle ear. The middle ear amplifies the vibrations of the tympanic membrane and transmits them to the inner ear. Now the inner ear, on the other hand, is the site of sound transduction. This is where we convert sound waves into graded potentials and eventually action potentials which travel to the brain and are eventually recognized as sound. Now before we go on to the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about the structure of the external ear. The external ear basically has two parts, the pinna, which is the ear lobe, and also the external acoustic meatus. So the purpose of the pinna or ear lobe is basically to funnel sound. Another name for the pinna is the oracle. And so it's sort of round and cup shaped and it's designed to funnel those sound waves into the external ear canal, also known as the external acoustic meatus. Now as those sound waves travel through the external acoustic meatus or external auditory canal, they're going to start to vibrate the tympanic membrane. So the tympanic membrane is basically our eardrum. It's a very thin sheet of tissue that vibrates ver very readily as sound waves move into the ear. And so everything on the right side of the tympanic membrane is going to be part of our middle ear. And so that tympanic membrane is going to vibrate, and as it vibrates, it's also going to vibrate the three ossicles that are attached to it. And those include the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And so these three bones are basically operating in a lever system and transmitting those vibrations from that very large tympanic membrane uh, onto a very small membrane, which is called the oval window. Now the oval window is basically the junction between the middle ear and the inner ear. And so because we have vibrations of a very large membrane, which are transmitted onto a very small membrane, this is essentially going to amplify the sound. Now as we push in on that oval window, uh, we're going to send this vibration into the inner ear. Now it's important to realize that the inner ear is filled with fluid, it's not really filled with air. And fluid is fairly incompressible. And so as we press on this fluid uh, with the stapes on the oval window, uh, that's going to set up fluid motion uh, through the cochlea and we need to dissipate that fluid motion at some point and that's going to be at the round window. So every time we push in on the oval window with the stapes, the round window is going to bow outwards and relieve a little bit of that pressure. Now another structure that I need to talk about here in the middle ear is something called the eustachian tube. Now the eustachian tube is a tube that helps to unite the middle ear with the pharynx. And the reason we have an eustachian tube is that it helps to equalize air pressure between the outside of the body and the inside of the body. Now you might notice if you go up in an airplane or you drive over a very tall mountain that your ears begin to pop. And that's because as you go up in altitude, the pressure inside your ear becomes greater because the air expands. And as the air expands, it has to have some way to get out. And that's basically the function of the eustachian tube. 
if you yawn or sort of grit your jaw a little bit, chances are that tube will open up just enough to let a little squeak of air into the pharynx and equalize those pressures. Now, if you've ever had a middle ear infection, that's because bacteria from the oral cavity in the pharynx can sometimes get up the cestation tube and infect the middle ear, causing something called otis media, or a middle ear infection. Now, otis media can be very, very painful. It can lead to a temporary reduction in hearing and a feeling of fullness within the ears. And so if you have chronic ear infections, you're going to probably have something done called a myringotomy. A myringotomy is where we take tubes and we use them to pierce the tympanic membrane. And these tubes allow excess fluid and pus and things like that to drain from the middle ear uh, into the external ear. Now let's take a look at the inner ear. Remember the purpose of the inner ear was to transduce sound. That is, it's taking those sound waves, which are vibrations in the ear, and transducing them into a graded potential and eventually an action potential, which is transmitted to the brain. And so the main organ of transduction here is the cochlea, and the cochlea is sort of a spiral, snail-shaped organ on the end of the vestibular apparatus. And so the cochlea is innervated by the vestibulocochlear nerve. There's a cochlear branch which just goes to the cochlea and carries sensory information with sound, but there's also a vestibular branch that goes to the vestibular apparatus. Now, even though the vestibular apparatus and the cochlea are really connected, uh, they have different functions. The cochlea is involved in transducing sound, whereas the vestibular apparatus gives us our sense of equilibrium. So now we're going to describe the process by which sound waves are eventually transduced into graded potentials and eventually action potentials. So the action starts as sound waves are funneled into the external ear by the auricle. Remember the auricle was simply the ear lobe, and another name for the auricle was the penna. So the sound waves move in through the auricle and into the external acoustic meatus, and then they're going to vibrate that tympanic membrane. Now another name for the tympanic membrane, of course, was the eardrum. Now, as that membrane vibrates, it's also going to vibrate the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And the stapes, remember, is pushing on the oval window. And the oval window is the junction between the middle ear and the inner ear. And so as we're pushing on the oval window, we're sending vibrations into the cochlea. And the cochlea here, remember, is filled mainly with fluid. And so the fluid here is very good at transmitting vibrations. And the fluid is initially going to flow through something called the scale of vestibuli. Now the scale of vestibuli is sort of the top duct that's connected to the oval window, and those sound waves are going to move through that fluid and eventually come out the other side through the scala tympani. And the scala tympani transmits fluid uh, in the reverse direction towards the round window. And remember, every time we push in on that oval window, the round window is going to bow out in the opposite direction. And that's because the inner ear, or cochlea here, is filled with fluid, and fluid is incompressible. Now, as we send vibrations through the fluid in that cochlea, we're going to start to vibrate something called the basilar membrane. Now, the basilar membrane is very difficult to see here, but the basilar membrane is where the hair cells are located. And as those hair cells are vibrated on the basilar membrane, it's going to basically crunch them into the tectorial membrane, which sits atop those hair cells. Okay, now we're going to take a closer look at how sound is transduced inside the cochlea. And so we've magnified here something called the organ of Corti, which is the area within the cochlea where transduction occurs. Now above us we have the scala vestibuli, and below us we have the scala tympani. And remember, these are fluid-filled canals, and as that fluid transmits the vibrations that were caused by the vibration of the stapes on the oval window, that's going to vibrate the basilar membrane. Now the basilar membrane is shown here, and it's basically the basement membrane on which the hair cells are located. Now the hair cells are special mechanoreceptor cells that are embedded in the basilar membrane. And you can see that the hair cells are connected to afferent sensory neurons. So this is another case where we're going to have two separate cells doing the process of transduction and transmission. It's the function of the hair cells to do the transduction. That is, when the basilar membrane vibrates, it's going to force the hair cells up into the tectorial membrane. And the hairs that are on the surface of those cells are going to be mashed down by the tectorial membrane, and that's going to cause a graded potential within those hair cells. And because these hair cells are specialized just for transduction, we call that graded potential a receptor potential. 
and so those hair cells form a receptor potential and then they are going to secrete a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter travels across to the afferent sensory neurons and elicits a separate action potential within these neurons. And remember, these sensory neurons are connected to the vestibulocochlear nerve. And so in a nutshell, this is how the hair cells within the inner ear are able to transduce the vibrations uh, that are sent into the cochlea into graded potentials and then eventually action potentials by the afferent sensory neuron. Now it's a lot more complex than this because remember, we're not just detecting one type of sound. We can detect high sounds and low sounds. We can detect loud sounds and soft sounds. And so the ear has an ability to distinguish uh, differences in frequency and also has the ability to detect differences in amplitude. And so I really would like you to stop this lecture now and click on the link below that says play. And this is going to take you to a really good animation that talks about how the inner ear and the cochlea are able to transduce these two different qualities of sound. That is loudness and also pitch. And so be sure to review this animation before you go on to the next slide because this information, of course, will be covered on the final exam.